Addiction is the great equalizer. Fighting the opioid epidemic in East Tennessee. Everybody I know has been touched by addiction. What that battle looks like now and the tools available right here helping people get clean. You never have to use again. The advice from experts on how to get help for yourself or your family. It's important that we don't discount the importance and the influence that we have on our children's behavior. And how you can help your kids recognize and fight addiction in our community early on. 280 people, that's how many people in Knox County alone have died this year due to a suspected overdose. Across the state, 1,818 people died of an overdose in 2018. That's the most recent data we have. The top county for deaths, Knox, followed by Davidson and Shelby. More Tennesseans died of an overdose in 2018 than in car crashes. There were 5.3 million opioid prescriptions in a state with 6.7 million people. Well, tonight we are tackling the issue head on, connecting you with resources to help. And we have a panel of experts on standby to answer your questions. But first, a story of hope and recovery. Reporter Grace King introduces us to Griffin Bond. I mean, I, I would have never imagined then that I'm going to school to help people. I'm working in treatment to help other people just start the process of recovery. Griffin Bond's struggle with addiction began at age 12. I just didn't fit in. Like something that I never felt okay. And so I started acting out, becoming a class clown, you know, trying to gain acceptance. He began smoking cigarettes, then marijuana, then prescription medications. It progressed from over the years of just that becoming a habit occasionally or socially um, to become dependent. Then he hit rock bottom. I was 23, about to be 24, and I just realized there was nothing. I looked at the past five years of my life, I did nothing with it. I was like, I'm gonna be dead, I'm gonna be dead. And I just knew there had to be something different than this. He went to a treatment center in Florida, got the support he needed, and began to turn his life around came back from unemployed, no place to live, to a job and, you know, stable housing and got to have some responsibility and pay, and it gave me purpose. It took a recovery program for him to find happiness and eventually his wife. He's the most amazing man that I've ever been with in my entire life. Today, Griffin is a stepfather. It's given us a family. A student. I'm in school to be a psychiatric nurse practitioner and a recovery advocate six years clean. You never have to use again. For Griffin and Brittany, recovery gave them a second chance. There is hope, there is freedom. One, they want others to have too. There's people waiting on you to get clean. There's people, you were so needed. I'm Grace King reporting. One of the people helping fight the epidemic is Jim Wahlberg. He is the executive director of the Mark Wahlberg Foundation, which focuses on helping young people. And Wahlberg has faced his own struggles with addiction. Here is his story. My story of addiction started at a, at a very, very young age. I had my first drink of alcohol and not like sneaking a sip of dad's beer, but a real, a real drink. Um, I was about eight years old. And then, um, you know, I think nothing really happened in terms of I didn't get drunk, I didn't get sick, but something happened to me inside in, in terms of I felt accepted. I felt liked, I, I made people laugh. I was with older kids. And so, you know, I was starved for, it, for attention. I'm, I'm one of nine children. My parents were working all the time, 24 hours a day, just to feed us. And so I looked for that attention in all the wrong places. And my difficulties with drugs and alcohol really started to really manifest themselves by the time I was 10 years old. I was already, you know, 
I was using drugs, I was drinking, I was smoking cigarettes, you name it, you know, and I progressed, you know, and, you know, they talk about progression and they talk about gateway drugs. And, um, and that process happened for me. You know, I started with, the, with a beer and I progressed to marijuana and of course the whole time I was smoking cigarettes and I progressed to anything that would make me feel different about the way I felt about myself because the way I felt about myself was not good. To shed more light about the recovery process and the help that's available, we gathered some of East Tennessee's opioid experts to break down the scope of the epidemic here. And we begin with Jan McCoy, who lost her son to an overdose back in 2014. She and our other experts want parents to be aware and educated about addiction. Well, Dan was a, your typical average kid. Um, he played sports all his life. He had a 3.2 grade point average when he graduated from high school. He was active in church, was in the children's choir. He was a good kid. Um, he did have a high anxiety level and he somehow, some way got a prescription from a pain clinic in Blunt County. And it wasn't long before he was addicted to pain, killer, pain pills. What do you tell uh, other families um that they should look for as far as warning signs go and then also what to do if indeed they find themselves in the same situation you found yourself in the warning signs are the distance he was very quiet with me we always had a very open relationship he could come to me for anything um, he started being very secretive and then i noticed that uh, things were missing from my home he started stealing from us and you know those were all flags but of course the sad part about addiction is the person that has it doesn't believe that they have anything wrong with them. It's a very complicated disease. I mean, he was not, you could not have a rational conversation with him. So it's difficult to get him the help that he needs. However, my advice to other parents is to, you know, set up boundaries as far as when he steals, they steal from you or they're disrespectful to you. Um, you have to set up new boundaries and let them know that, that that's not going to be tolerated and then make sure that you follow through on those boundaries. To be honest with you, as soon as a child can read, even if you're having to administer like over-the-counter medications, like say your child has a fever, let them help you, you know, pull out the medicine, let them help you read the label, how much does it say you should take, let them help you measure it out. And just during the course of doing that, as a parent, you're sending a message that it's important to take things as directed, it's important to measure and to be accurate and never take more than you're supposed to. The earlier the better, because genetic predisposition occurs at birth if there's a family history. And addiction is not just to substances, at the village, what we do is we teach about process addictions, and those are behavioral addictions that um, can come very early and can be in the family, even if there's no substance use. So the earlier, the better. Well, we know this education is happening in schools, but it's important from your perspective, as I understand, to have it going on both at school and at home. Why is that so important? Well, again, parents have the greatest influence on their children, um, even as teenagers, when they do the eye rolling and <laughs> pretend like they, they don't really care what you have to say, they are listening. So it's important that we don't discount the importance and the influence that we have on our children's behavior. And so it's very important as parents that we arm ourselves with accurate information because again, kids can fact check Access this day, you know, these days uh, they can Google anything. And so you need to make sure that you understand the facts out there so that you can give accurate information to your kids and you need to be that askable parent. Families need to have these conversations. You need to have an open and frank dialogue with your kids. You need to listen to them. You need to have an understanding of what's going on in your own medicine cabinets as well as what's going on in the school and in your community.
And we have our full interviews with all of those experts right now at WBIR.com. Just click in the As Seen on TV section of our app. And we know this is a complicated topic, and we are here to help you find the answers. If you have a question for any of our experts, just text them to us. The number is 865-637-1010. We will answer them after this special in a Q&A style town hall on Facebook Live and on our YouTube page. Still ahead tonight, how drugs work, the chemicals that create addiction and the barriers to getting treatment in East Tennessee. And as we go to break, the National Addiction Hotline is open 20 24 7 to provide help and these national websites have dozens of resources we'll be right back More than 46,000 drug overdose deaths involving opioids were reported in the US in 2018 Now what does that mean for Tennessee more than 1800 drug overdose deaths and in Knox County the number of suspected OD deaths so far this year has already surpassed the total number of deaths in 2019. So if opioids continue to kill thousands every year, why do people still fall into addiction? Drug experts say it all has to do with a chemical called dopamine. And here's how the addicted brain works. When you do something you enjoy, like riding a bike, the brain releases endorphins. Those attached to opioid receptors releasing normal levels of dopamine, giving you a natural euphoria. The effects are different with drugs. When opioids attach to endorphin receptors, the brain releases an excess of dopamine, overstimulating the brain and causing a high. And when the high ends, the addiction kicks in. Drug experts say when you take opioids repeatedly over time, the body slows its production of endorphins and builds tolerance. Now, this means in order to reach the same flood of good feelings, the body needs to take in higher doses of opioids. As far as treatment goes, what would you tell people about its availability for people who are trying to conquer an addiction in this community? Well, I would just tell people to continue to try to seek out some type of treatment because it's very difficult sometimes in our area because of the lack of resources. Um, I actually had two gentlemen I had to send out of town just last week. But I would just encourage families and um, families of loved ones who struggle with addiction to just seek out some type of help from someone that is knowledgeable of the treatment process or the counseling process or just find someone in the field that knows information about how to get someone into treatment. I know that those who have insurance will more than likely get into treatment faster than those who don't have insurance. And that's one of the biggest gaps right now is trying to navigate the treatment centers with the person who needs to be treated. And that's a really difficult process, especially here in our area, because there's limited resources for those who need treatment that do not have the funds to get into treatment. And that's what we run up, that's what we run up against on a daily basis. That, that speaks to the socioeconomic side. What about the race side? Is it harder to get treatment if you're black or Hispanic? I can just speak for being a black man. In, in our culture, um, it's not really suggested that we go to treatment. And I think that's one of the biggest uh, problems that we have because addiction affects everyone. And I just hope that now that we see is that addiction is crossing all lines, color, race, ethnicity, gender. And we got to be more proactive with saying, hey, you need to go get help. Another part of the overdose epidemic, the loss and heartbreak. Up next, why one mother who lost a son to addiction says people should not be ashamed to ask for help. And as we go to break, this is a statewide hotline you can call anytime for assistance. Addiction has certainly taken a toll on East Tennessee during the past decade. But those left behind are fighting to make a difference. Reporter Grace King introduces us to one Blunt County mother who isn't afraid to start that conversation. I am from embraces, from that of a mother's arm, the lick of a dog, the cold taste of a snowflake. From impacts of pain, shame, pleasure, and love beyond measure. For Mimi Bristow, this poem is a reminder of her son. At high school, is that amazing? 
Joseph Bristow was a writer, an athlete, and a kid who lit up the room. He'd make everybody smile. He always liked to laugh. He was loud. He had a lot of promise. But like his father, Joseph struggled with addiction. I watched him for 12 years struggle being addicted. We went through the gamut with him. He tried program after program. He went to the ranch. He did detox at Want Memorial. He went to Cornerstone. He did True Purpose. And finally got clean. He was going back to school. He was talking about getting a law degree. But after 14 months sober, Joseph relapsed. I don't know what sparked him to want to use again. On December 3rd, 2019, he died from an overdose. In his obituary, I put that he lost his battle with drug addiction. Well, a bunch of my friends said, oh, you know, that's brave that you did that. I said, it's not brave, it's the truth. And people should not be ashamed. And that phrase was Mimi's way of raising awareness. Everybody I know has been touched by addiction. And her way of letting others know there is help. It shouldn't be a secret. It shouldn't be something you hide. So that's the best advice I can give any parent. Get some help. Go and seek out help wherever that is. I'm Grace King reporting. And if you need help, there are countless resources right here in East Tennessee. They include the Metro Drug Coalition and the McNabb Center. Their websites are listed on the screen, and you can find more in the As Seen on TV section of the 10 News app. Addiction is something, unfortunately, many parents have to face. A recovery therapist with Village Behavioral Health breaks down what you should know as a parent to protect your child. I have a handful of questions I'd like to ask you from our viewers, and let's begin with this one. What should I do if I suspect my child is taking drugs? Make sure that you're having a conversation even before you have that situation occur. You want to talk about what's going to happen if that situation does occur and have the rules, kind of clear, concise rules of what's going to happen. The biggest thing is not to overreact because you don't want to shut down the lines of communication with your team. You don't want to teach them not to come to you. It's a really awesome thing to have your team come to you and tell you that something's happening. But if you suspect it, the best thing to do is to gain evidence first before you address them. Tell them things like the things that you've seen that are different and don't overreact but also don't ignore your gut instincts either. You wanna make sure if, you're, if you know your child, if their priorities are changing, if they're acting different, you definitely wanna in, interrupt anything that could be happening. You touched on this a little bit, but what if a parent finds drugs in their child's room? What's the next step? Just talk to your child about the consequences of drug use and also how it changes people's priorities and just let them know that there are consequences and there are wheels that are set into motion once they start using or once the drugs are found. And it's not the parent doing it to them, it's them doing it to themselves. A lot of parents are monitoring mm -hmm. their children's social media. What if they start to see things right. there that concern them? Well, the big thing is to keep the lines of communication open and then also under, have them understand about how privacy is, is awarded to them. It's not a given. And there are ways definitely keep yourself informed regarding your child because it is your business, especially when the fines are going to be paid by you and especially when, you know, you could be legally held responsible for something that they do. So keep the lines open and then also have them understand that if they're lying about it on top of that, that is an indication of a bigger problem or an addiction forming. Because drug use doesn't automatically mean addiction, um, but it definitely can. It is the first progression of addiction. It's the first stage. Now we know you still have questions about the OD epidemic, so send them to us. 
to 865-637-1010, and we will do our best to get you answers. We are answering a lot of those questions in a couple of minutes on the WBIR Channel 10 Facebook page. Our panel of experts will share their experiences and answer your questions. We appreciate you watching tonight. 10 News at 6 is next.